Well, good morning again. Uh, let's just pray, shall we? Well, let's not just pray, let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that we are here. Thank you for your word. Lord, I ask that you will speak to each and every one of us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, it's lovely to be back. For those who don't know, been on three weeks holiday. We uh, had a great time, didn't we, love? Yeah, good. Um, we had a great holiday. We camped. Yeah, in a tent. We camp. We, we are campers. We enjoy camping with a proper tent. Um, you know, uh, yeah, we won't go down there. Uh, with uh, proper camping. Um, so we were in the open, green fields, oceans, fresh air, meeting new people, peace and quiet. Loved it. And it was wet and it was windy as well. And it was seriously windy. There were times we were reaching sort of 30, 35 mile per hour, miles per hour gusts. One tent bends in really, really nicely. Uh, the Lord had provided on this. We had uh, people camping either side of us who we'd met um, and they were great. And we turned up one day to discover that they had gone round and re-pegged all the guide ropes that had been popping out of the ground of the wind and they had done owls and it was really fantastic and you felt God had really provided some really great people. We had a lovely time. Yeah, praise the Lord. We then came back to noise, pollution, discourteous drivers, police sirens. This is as we returned home by the way, this literally as we returned home. Um, as we were returning home uh, we were nearly sideswiped twice by seriously drivers cutting us up was not my bad driving before anybody says anything. Because when you're on holiday, it's amazing, you know, you part, people pass you and you, they thank you and you thank, they thank you back. You pass someone, you go thank you and they thank you back. Back here. So I nearly got, I, I mean legitimately, we um, drive in, driving, car decided it was impatient so it took us down the inside on the bus lane um, but you know it was the other car that was also in the bus lane just ahead of him so he did this I had to slam on the anchors it's amazing how one foot can hit the brake the other hand can hit the horn and what comes out of my mouth anyway <laughs> and also as we pulled into our streets there was a, a drug deal happening I'm not joking this literally happens. We pulled in, and then as I parked up, uh, one of our local in one of our local streets uh, pulled up, and he was waving me to move on, so he could park in the space that I've just taken. <laughs> that is as we arrived from our holiday, which was wonderful, peaceful, quiet, felt refreshed. Now. It was at this point, it is so easy for us to dwell on that naffness, to be honest with you. It could so easily have pulled one down, if one really sat with it. I could then talk about my neighbours who greeted us, friendly like, you know, oh, you're back. Found out about our neighbours were looking after the mother-in-law by they'd noticed that some stranger had got up onto our flat roof. And now bear with us, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. There's a story coming, wait, it's okay. Um, and so they went and double checked to make sure that my mother-in-law was all right. Turns out it was the window cleaner. They didn't know, but the fact they didn't know, but they wanted to make sure, do you see what I mean? So, and I could go on about that. So there you go. Got greeted by the cat. It's always a good thing. So one could really, dwell on the naffness and it's very easy to be pulled down. Now that's a really superficial looking at life. But it's just to give you the stark contrast that we had. I want to read from Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 to 20. Oh no, I want to tell you the other thing. So I returned back to the office here on Wednesday spent a day and a half 
getting my computer to connect to the internet so that I could download a few hundred emails that are there. So if you sent me an email and I've not responded yet, now you know why. That was frustrating to say the least. <laughs> you thought, good. So Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 20. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armour so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, Put on, on, put on every piece of God's armour so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armour of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. I am in chains now, still preaching this message as God's ambassador. So pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should. Well known, well versed spoken on it enough times or made reference to it enough times. But I just want to do a quick summary of the letter of Ephesians. It's okay, be quick. Paul starts by stating in Ephesians in chapter 1, 19 to 23, basically what we've got. I also pray that you'll understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honour at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. We've got everything. Amen? Amen. Then he reflects in chapter 2 on, well our citizenship a little bit, but he also quotes what it is that Christ brought. And he puts this, he brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people who are members of God's family. So we are citizens of God's family. Yeah? And he has brought peace into the world and that reconcilable peace. So as part of this summary, this connects to why we've got at the end of Ephesians... Therefore, put on God's armour. Then in 3.16, he then states, I told you he's going to have a quick summary of Ephesians. You couldn't get much quicker than this. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. This is what you got. This is who you are. Now pray you're going to get this inner strength. You're really going to understand who you 
are and what you've got. And then in 4 verse 23, he sort of looks and what it means uh, with all this stuff that Christ has come, brought this peace, made you citizens of heaven rather than citizens of this planet. You know, you've got this inner strength. What does this look like in reality? What should that mean your response should be? And in Ephesians 4, 23 to 24, it says this. Uh, actually, no, um, let's do from 21. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. It's putting on your new self. And this is very important when we come to look at the armour of God. And then from this, he then notes how relationships should... Relationships should be. We can see that there is relationships here between... Wives and husbands, the great famous one. Wives, submit to your husbands. And most husbands would like it to stop there. But it doesn't. Absolutely, thank God. Amen, my sister. It then says, doesn't it, Timmy, Timmy, that you need to love your wife as Christ loved the church. Amen? (laughs) Earlier on, it says, don't lie. No. So... (laughs) Timmy's a great example. But that's that whole point that actually, it hammers then at husbands, by the way, quite more heavily than it hammers at the wives. But it shows about relationships. It then looks at relationships between children and parents. How the children should be, but also how the parents should be to their children. All because of what Christ has done through Ephesians, through the peace, becoming citizens of heaven, Uh, putting on our new self. And then it also then goes on about servants and masters. Well, I think today we're going to change that to staff and managers. Oh, there's a wave. (laughs) But it talks about how our relationship should be. And therefore then, when you read all of that, you get to this final bit in chapter 6. So therefore, and finally, because of all this, Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on all of God's armour. Now, sound argument, quickly, very quick. The letter of Ephesians is written to a church. Therefore, it's written to a group of people. So therefore, the church is to put on the whole armour of God. But it's also written to the church who's made up of individuals. Wave your hand if you're an individual and present. If you're not sure you're an individual, just look in the mirror. Physically, you normally are. Therefore then, you're also to put on the full armour of God because if we don't do it as individuals, we can't do it as a church. And let's be honest, you spend more time physically out there as an individual than you do in here as a body, yes? Notice the phrase, physically. Spiritually, we're all connected. So, this putting on all of God's armour is actually a direct allusion to what I read earlier in chapter 4 about putting on your new self. Putting on the new creation, getting rid of the old you, This putting on the armour of God, we're not going to go through the whole armour today, but putting on the armour of God is actually this direct allusion that Paul is making in chapter 4 about uh, putting on your new self, your new created self in Christ. Your new creation, amen? You with me? Your new identity. It's that direct allusion. And in a moment you're going to see how some of this is taken from Isaiah. Some of this imagery is taken from Isaiah. Okay. When you buy a new piece of clothing and you put it on, you've tried it on in the changing rooms, haven't you? Yeah? Most of us. Some men go, yeah, that'll do. I'm not one of them. 
I have to have my wife with me come out. Do I look all right in this? At the moment, she wants me to get... Anyway, but when you put on a new piece of clothing, it makes you feel good, doesn't it? Yeah? No? Sort of... Hello? Good morning! Excellent. Okay, right. I have no personal illusions. I have no delusions neither. <laughs> I most certainly don't after the holiday. I'm back on the diet. Right, so, um, but you put on a new piece of clothing, don't you? And it makes you feel good. And sometimes you can choose clothing that can change how you look at yourself. I'm actually fascinated. Some, when I wear a flat cap, I'm amazed how a number of you here don't recognise me when you see me in the street. You actually pass right past me and you suddenly realise it's me. I didn't recognise you. It's really changed your look. <coughs> It's my disguise. <laughs> but when you put on that uh, new clothing, or when you put on fancy dress, who's ever done fancy dress? Come on. Come on. I remember years ago when the, this church, many, many, I'm talking years ago here, we're talking the 90s, late 90s, uh, we used to join the Greenford Carnival when the Greenford Carnival actually had like floats and stuff. And we as a church did it once. And I went as Darth Vader. I tell you, your personality changes the minute you've got that cape on, that breastplate there with the... And you've got the helmet on. Oh, man, nobody knew who I was. I can't do it now. I found your lack of faith disturbing. Anyway, the... um, I should preach like that one, don't I? I find your lack of... Anyway. But when you put it on, your whole persona changes, doesn't it? You can encompass the persona of who you are fancy dressed up as, yeah? So come on, who wants to be Wonder Woman? Men, keep your hands down. <laughs> put on, you know, when you put on a fancy dress, you do change. And people don't know who you are. You could go to a completely strange place. And you could be somebody completely different, can't you? But the minute you take it all off, it's you. Yeah? It's like going on holiday. I deliberately wear shorts and a t-shirt on holiday. I, you know, I wear everything that's completely different to what I would normally wear. You wouldn't know who I was and what I did. But you take it off and it's just you. Well, putting on the armour of God, putting on your new self is not like that. It is not a falsality. It is not hidden underneath or behind a mask. When you put on the armour of God, when you put on the new self, the Christ image that he wants you to be, that is something that happens on the inside. You become the new creation. You are the new creation. You live, breathe, exist the new creation that you are, that Christ has bought for you as a citizen of heaven. Amen? That's what he's getting at here. This is not a once every now and again, take it off, put it back on, how I feel about it. Shall I bother putting on the armour of God today? Oh, I don't know, I'm not really in the mood for it, you know what I mean? It is actually a permanent position. You don't only just walk around in it, you sleep in it. This is what he means here about putting on this all of God's armour. It is not just about fighting, it's about your new self the changing of the old you into the new way that God wants you to be. So why do we do this? Well, we of us who have chosen to be followers of Christ, chosen the side that fights evil. Strange, actually. Do you ever think, I thought about this, when I came to Christ, nobody actually ever told me I was going into a war. Did anybody ever tell you that when you first came to know Jesus? You got to hear about God's love for you, which is great, yeah? And that's the primary thing. But nobody actually told you, by the way. (laughs) You're right in a good old fight now, by the way. Just let you know. Now, we've chosen the side that's won already. Amen? Amen? But we're still involved in the skirmishes. We've chosen the side that will be attacked at every angle. Amen? Not cheerful thought, but that's true. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, then you have chosen the easy life. You've chosen the side that has lost already. They just haven't quite fully grasped that yet. Good news is you can decide to swap sides right now. 
the side that's won is always ready for new recruits until the war's all over. So if you haven't quite decided yet, maybe now is the time to sign up and enlist. Anyway, we have chosen already, have signed up to be in a war zone, and whether we like it or not, we are fighting, not flesh and blood, but against rulers, uh, evil rulers and authorities of this unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. And these spiritual enemies can come in different guises and forms, can they not? They don't necessarily have to come from out there somewhere. They can come in the guise of people. It's not the person, it's the spirit that's behind them. It's the spirit behind them. Those particular people, by the way, have chosen the losing side. They just don't know it. And a lot of people, when they come in those guises to attack us, they don't even know what they're actually really doing. They don't realise actually there's some sort of evil power behind them that's actually provoking them on. And if they don't know Jesus, they're dead in their spirit. So they really aren't alive to anything. So therefore then, they're alive to what the devil wants them to do. Selfish ambition and all that sort of stuff. But need I tell any of us what it's like to be attacked by physical forces when it comes in different guises, in different formats? I liked Edwards here. The devil and his minions. It's interesting, isn't it? How I've just thought of this. This is brilliant. Sorry, this just dawned on me. It's amazing how we call the devil and his minions, the devil and his little devils, and the little minions, and he actually called Dominion and Minions. It's interesting that now we call these little cute yellow characters Minions. It's changing the language, the subtlety, because they look cute. They are cute. I'm not knocking them. Somebody had the audacity to call my mini a minion. <laughs> Nobody in this church, you're all right. But that's just, just interesting how language changes, and we, we're our languages adopt to change views. Anyway, that's a sideline. Anyway, the devil and his minions are able to rule the lives of men and women who belong to his tyranny of darkness, Colossians 1.13. They are called children of disobedience, as in Ephesians 2.2. 2. And the powers exploit culture and social systems in their attempts to wreck the creative and saving work of God. This means that they come in our social or business structure by its rules and regulations. Normally, attacks upon Christians are actually done by rules and regulations. We've got this in place, so that somehow gets manipulated for attack. It can be used for wrong reasons. Evil can come by, its own, by our own corrupted culture, with our social niceties. I know, like holding up honour just to keep the family name protected and actually know what's going on should be shamed and brought out into truth. Evil comes in so many forms and guises. Fascinating for me, I was watching the news this morning, and they were doing the whole papers on the BBC News, and one of the things they pulled up now is that the John Lewis has decided for baby clothing to go gender neutral. Okay, so what that now means is, is that you can basically buy yellow, white jumpers, neutral colours and neutral outfits. So therefore they're no longer the dresses and the pinafores and all of that. So they're going to go down sort of the trouser and the t-shirt front, but that's not quite how it works because normally on the male side, it's the males that wear the trousers and generally not unless you're Scotland and you're Scottish and you wear a kilt. But that's what John Lewis had gone. Now the news reporter, the, the commentator from the, some uh, journalist from a paper, she just literally sat there and went, I just think this is ridiculous. This is just ridiculous. We're not allowing kids to be kids. With, with some social or political agenda is here to try and make everything PC, she said, and neutral. 
and to almost cave it in to the size that you can't ever go outside of this social structure. This is just ridiculous, she said. Now, the two BBC news reporters were clearly trying to give the more liberal argument. You could see that what they had, they probably had somebody in their ear. And probably what you had to see, they're probably going to get done for slander here, but anyway. But what you then saw was they had to sort of shut it down. They had to sort of say, let's move on. And the journalist said, yes, I'm now getting off of my soapbox. And I thought, this is how evil comes about in our social structures. It's ridiculous. Let boys be boys and let girls be girls. And if the boys want to go and play with a doll, let the boy play with a doll. It doesn't mean he's having a gender identity issue. It's just being a boy playing with a doll. And if a girl wants to play with a car, then let her. She's not having a gender identity issue. She wants to pick up a sword, or whatever. Yeah, I know, I'm just thinking of things that men normally are meant to play with. Mind you, yesterday I got out my flamethrower and I went, man's tall. And it is a man's tall, right? <laughs> so, but the point I'm getting at, that's how evil comes and that's how it starts suppressing. I, we don't have to know within uh, certain structures like the school and the education system, they're doing this. Let's try and make it more neutral. And then within... within Social structures now, family structures and all of that. Evil can reside because we're not willing to say that's wrong. That was not part of the sermon this morning. Moving on. And this is how it comes. And we have to, as it says here, be alert at all times. In verse 18, pray in the spirit on all times and every occasion. Stay alert. Anyway, let's focus on some of the items of our... Um, actually, yeah, no, let's go back. Do you know what Satan's uh, rule is? Do you know what he wants to do, his ultimate aim? His ultimate aim is just to stop the saving grace of Christ reaching people. That's all it is. It's not to get at you or to get at me. It's just to stop God's saving grace reaching people. That's all it is. Okay. Therefore, verse 13, therefore put on every piece of God's armour so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. We put on this armour so we can resist the enemy in the time of evil. And then after we've been in the battle, we're still standing firm. What's this armour? So armour is what Christ has given you. It's who you are in him. Therefore then, you can stand. <coughs> so let's look at some of the three items. We're going to look at only three today, and I'm going to finish off next week. You all right with that? You better be, because you don't want me to go on for too long. So... The belt of truth. Put on the belt of truth. Now, we know this imagery was used uh, of a Roman soldier, and that's what Paul was doing, was thinking the Roman soldiers, but I'm not going to go into all of that in the moment. But the belt of truth was the thing with the flaps. Who's watched enough movies with Roman centurions in them? Please put your hands up. Save me having to describe it. Excellent. Huh? Yeah, the strips of... The, like Normally, some of the strips... Of, yeah? Yeah, cool. So... On there, it's the belt, and that's what sort of generally holds everything in. But this belt of truth is actually the belt of truth of God's promises of future salvation that is for us now. If we take the truth of the gospel that Jesus came and died for the world and we are all saved, when we stick that round our girth, no matter how big or how thin you are, that belt of truth holds everything in, doesn't it? And that is who you are in Christ. And that is amazing. And so when we go out, we should have that on to say, no matter what happens today, I'm saved. And it's true because God has said it. Amen? Amen. Also, the flip side is about us being truthful about what we're really doing. This is a bit we're not going to like. About being honest. Especially if there is a persistent sin in our lives, it's good for us to be honest with trusted people to say, I've got a real problem with this, help. Why? Because if you feel you need to hide something from fellow Christians, 
and Satan is going to use that to attack you. It's good for us to be truthful about what is going on for us. But more importantly, it's true to put that on to say what Christ has done for us. Amen? Breastplate of righteousness. Well, now, or as it says in the NLT version, uh, it says, and, uh, and, and the body armour of God's righteousness. So, it's the breastplate of armour. Shump. Goes over the breast. Looks a bit like this waistcoat. So, it's over that. It's this breastplate of righteousness. Well, I want to go to Isaiah 59, verse 17, to see where Paul got this imagery from. He says this, and this is talking about... Well, I'm actually going to go up just a little bit. It's talking about... This is talking about God's... Um, coming in as God, as Lord is a warrior, coming in to redeem Israel, to sort things out. So I'm actually going to go back a little bit because actually this is quite interesting. We know we have rebelled and have denied the Lord. We have turned our backs on God and know how unfair and oppressive we have been, carefully planning our deceitful lies. Our courts oppose the righteous and justice is, fo found, is nowhere to be found. Truth stumbles in the streets, and honesty has been outlawed. Yes, truth is gone, and anyone who renounces evil is attacked. Ah, oh, what does that sound like? The Lord looked and was displeased to find there was no justice. He was amazed to see that no one intervened to help the oppressed. So he himself stepped in to save them from his, with his strong arm, and his justice sustained him. He put on righteousness as his body armour and placed the helmet of salvation on his head. And then it goes on to what the Lord then goes to do. So it's from this Isaiah that God's righteousness, body armour, puts on his own body armour of righteousness, of who he is, justice, to free his people. We are to put on God's righteousness to stand against the blows and arrows of the evil one. In Isaiah there, it's God's righteousness that brings salvation. And therefore, we put on the salvation of God, i.e. the saved self, the new self, and we can stand against the evil one. And stand against the blows of Satan. The shoes, and this is the one I want to focus on the most for a moment. For shoes... Put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you are fully prepared, it says. That's the NLT. Also, there's a footnote for the MLT, which I prefer slightly better. For shoes, put on the readiness to preach the good news of peace with God. very easy for us to jump to the belt, the breastplate, the shield, the helmet, the sword. Those are the things that really stand out. Shoes are a bit boring, aren't they? Unless, of course, you've got 60 pairs of them in your wardrobe. No, anybody? Jonathan, really. But actually, the shoes probably are the most important. What are these shoes for? What are the feet for that rest in them shoes for? Well, they're to be the readiness to preach the good news. And again, Paul's taken this imagery from Isaiah. Isaiah 52, verse 7. And it states, How beautiful are the mountains, are the feet of the messenger who brings good news. The good news of peace and salvation. The news that the God of Israel reigns. So in this imagery here in the armour of God, these shoes are taken from that. It's the messenger who announces good news. In Isaiah, this messenger is almost seen as imagery of bouncing along the mountains. And when he comes across Israel, goes, peace, salvation, good news, your God reigns. Now, that's what we should also take on board from this. 
that our God reigns. Amen? And therefore, we are, when we put on these feet, these shoes that are fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace, it is about us standing firm in that peace, knowing that we are saved, that God is with us, and our God reigns, amen? No matter what the circumstances look like, he reigns. But also those feet, and this is the bit that we like to avoid, those are fitted for us to be ready to give the gospel of peace, to step forward in them, to take back the territory that Satan has. So when evil comes, it's not just our job just to stand, it's also to walk forward with the gospel of peace and take back the ground. So here's a challenging question for you. When evil comes at you, when you're having a lousy day or something's really badly going wrong, are you ready to preach the gospel of peace in that situation? Or are you just sort of worried more about the fact you're being attacked? Something really stood out for me. I've never seen it before until I was really reflecting that actually the third piece of the the body arm, the third piece of the clothing that goes on is not actually there entirely for attack. It's about bringing good news of Christ into the situation. Let's be honest, our normal reaction is to go, yeah, how dare you do this to me? How dare you make this happen to me? I'm going to get my own back. I can't wait to have it. And maybe God's saying, yes, it's an injustice. Yes, it's wrong. It doesn't mean you don't push back. But in that, bring the gospel of peace. Because the person or the, the institution that's doing that to you, the social structure or the cultural structure that's doing that to you, needs to know Christ in it. Because they need to be set free. Amen? And the gospel of peace is the most offensive piece of the piece of armour. So I don't know about how you, when you put your shoes on tomorrow morning, maybe sort of imagine yourself putting on the gospel of peace. Gospel of peace does not mean, my brothers and sisters, doormat. Paul would not be using the imagery of armour, meaning you're to be a doormat. But it's about what is actually first and foremost in our minds when rubbish comes our way. When evil approaches us and attacks us. Are we more worried about self-preservation rather than the other self-preservation who need, need, need to know the gospel of Christ? Because wouldn't it be amazing? Here's an imagery for you. Somebody's attacking you, and it's the evil spirit behind them that's doing it. You come in and say, do you know something? Jesus loves you. And that's all they want to hear, and they suddenly break down. And they want to come to know Christ, and they accept Christ at that moment, and then everything else disappears. Now, that's a beautiful paradise imagery. But the point I'm getting at is, that actually sometimes that could be a living reality. So, putting on God's armour is putting on the new self. It's focusing on who Christ is and what he has done, not on the rubbish that is before us. Coming back to my thing, we could have come back from our holiday and I could have really hit further rock bottom than possibly known to man. And we can do that on a daily basis when we walk around in our daily lives. But actually our focus is meant to be on who Christ is and what he has done. And as it says in Isaiah 52, 7, our God our God And our God who reigns wants to reign in the lives of everybody we come across because he wants no one to perish, but everyone to come to know Christ. I want to summarise with this. We need to recognise that Satan's role 
is to destabilize, disable us as well from bringing peace. His role is to get our focus wrong. To focus on the trouble and not on the good. Satan's role is to get us to become ineffective by tricking us into falling to our old ways of life. He actually wants to disrobe us of God's armour so that we become ineffective. He wants to disrobe us of God's, of our identity in Christ. Next week, when we look at the rest of the clothing, the rest of the armour, we will see how some of that works for us and how we can hang on to it. I'd like us to take a few moments just to take some prayer. Could you look at your feet, at your shoes? I don't care what they look like, if they've been polished today or not. Take a look at your feet. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then your feet at all times should be fitted with the gospel of peace the readiness of the gospel of peace. It is to bring a firm foundation, but it is also to bring about and tread the gospel of peace into the enemy's territory. So as you look at your feet, I want us to pray metaphorically for our feet. Lord, I ask for each of us going forward into this week where as people have been saying already, life is returning back to normal. The holiday season is over. And for some of us, we may not be walking in, we don't know if we're walking into any trouble or not. For some of us, we know we're walking into trouble this week. We're walking into evil this week. Lord, I pray for those that they will know your peace, your strength, the glorious, immeasurable riches of your power. Lord, pray for them and all of us here that we will be able to walk the gospel of peace into every single situation. In the name of Jesus, amen. John. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.